while we're um, waiting, I would like to ask um, Aggie, would you please uh, say a little prayer for us? Everybody stand. Tuesday, <laughs> share the experiences on the behalf of the group. Uh, unfortunately, Florence is not here, but she got to, I got to show her uh, a copy of the presentation, and I got the thumbs up from her that, good job. And uh, Ruth Demerit, uh, she's here, and she's on towards the second from the right here. Yeah, Ruth. And she got to see it, and so I got the, the thumbs up from her, too. And that meant to know they're both ravens, so that makes me feel good too. <laughs> and um, over here is Eric Hollinger. You can introduce yourself. I'm a travel liaison in the repatriation office of the Natural History Museum and Anthropology Department. That's the Smithsonian Institution Natural History Museum. And my clinic name is Duck Wu. I'm adopted Dr. Wei Di. He's my little brother. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and as you can see, our first. Duck yes. Wu. What is his kind of name? Duck Wu. Harold says he's white skin of the killer whale. Duck Wu. Okay. And my throat is so raspy, it made that sound. Duck Wu. Duck Wu. Yeah. Yeah, Duck Wu. Duck Wu. Yeah. So, um,. We have the Teslin uh, delegation, welcome. Glad to let you here to support us. My dear cousin, my true cousin, he's almost, he is like a brother for me, he's here too. A very good friend, Flo Murray, who I'm staying with, known them for many years. Joanne Wita and Andy. Um, Joanne was the original uh, grant writer for this program and Andy is a, Headmaster for the Kakwantan. Welcome, you folks here. Next to Andy is a, a wonderful elder, Selena Everson. She's Deshi Tom from Angoon. Uh, more people are coming in. Another um, headmaster, Ray Wilson. He's Kitsadi. 
welcome. And uh, if I miss anybody, I'm, I'm sorry. I haven't met you, but welcome as well. Uh, Linda, I might have to leave early, so I'd like to um, say a few words if I may. That's fine. Okay. We, we can't thank Joanne, Joanne. for uh, Joanne really just wouldn't have happened without Joanne. Joanne wrote the grant proposals for the Recovering Voices program and actually had to, had to write it twice. So we really had a lot of patience. <laughs> That's not what I was coming up with. <laughs> I'm, I'm taking advantage of her delay, delaying tactic here to, uh, to, 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 uh, to uh, uh, honor and thank her because this would not have been possible without her hard work and patience. So a little stinker. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say thank you to both of you. And um, because, Linda, thank you so much. Um, first off, I want to say thank you to Eric and his wife, Lauren. Um, we had the occasion to go down to the Smithsonian. It was my first time to go down there. And that's why I wanted to talk to all of you publicly, real short. <laughs> and um, just it, the, when we were able to see the artifacts in the Smithsonian, we were heavy with heart to want to share with all of our Senget and bless Eric's heart and they'll probably talk about the Grand Tour but they have a program called Recovering Voices and so the people at the Smithsonian worked with me and I tried my best the first time around to write a grant and we didn't get it and I want to recognize one gentleman that pushed me very hard Alan Zuboff from Angoon, he's not here today but he kept on calling and saying, are we going to go after that grant again? Are we going to go after that grant again? And so I got the courage to go up and get it. Andrew and I had planned to go, and it was about a week before or so, um, we called upon Linda, and she graciously, my sister-in-law, took my husband's place, and she went full throttle and made the trip happen. So first off, I want to say thank you to the Recovering Voices Program and the Smithsonian, and to Eric and his wife for always being so gracious. We are so fortunate that Mark Jacobs and um, Edwell John have adopted you into the Dusk <coughs> And uh, so I want to thank you so much because you care so much for our city of people and, it, and it's highly noticed and recognized and there's just not enough words to say thank you. And Linda, Jeez. your sister Jeez. and my sister-in-law, I want to say thank you so much. You rested our heart in bringing all these fine people down, and especially to the artifacts, your care and kindness once you got down to the Smithsonian and your care and love. So I want to present this to you with my brother, Ray. Good yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> Good morning, one you're thinking about it. I want to thank Eric too for opening his house and uh, his, we felt so good about it that we, uh, the kids that they adopted his wife to be one of us. So, and now uh, uh, Lauren is part of us because he treated us so well. So thank you, Eric. And she is. And she is. She is. And, uh, the words back to your wife and let her know that. So we really appreciate what you guys do. She wishes she could be here to yes. spend time with you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to make a presentation to, to your wife, Lauren. Actually, for both of you, every time uh, things are going on in Washington, D.C., uh, he always opens up his house to uh, the, the delegation from Alaska. So. Uh, we want to say thank you very much for doing that, and so this is for Lauren. Appreciation. Yes. And we want to thank you too for, for all of this. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> well, this, this picture says it all. We're in front of the Capitol building on a nice day, and uh, this picture was taken. This little gal here is Violet, Garfield's daughter. She was a precious, Gunga precious. Tea. Yeah, Gunga tea. and then this is Gabby. 
becoming a, uh, a beautiful young um, Kilowell woman. Her mother, uh, Shkin, who is uh, the headmaster for the Kilowell Tooth House. My aunt, uh, Lauren Shakely, she is um, Sakai from my grandfather's house. There's me. <laughs> and this is Ellen Zuboff that we mentioned earlier from Angoon that uh, was after, and goodness cheesh to him for being persistent. And then this is Ruth Deverett. She is from Cake, and she is an elder, very knowledgeable in the Tlingit language as well as NT flow. And then this is Virginia Oliver. She is the trailblazer with uh, teaching the Tlingit language and experimenting with different types of technology, and she's from Wrangell. And not pictured here are Shirley Kendall and her husband were also able to join us yeah. for this. So I think at our maximum we had almost 12, 12 Tlingit in the yeah. delegation. We went over the limit. <laughs> <laughs> and some came on their own. So uh, here. <laughs> so we were there, people started calling and saying, hey, yeah, I'm Tlingit over there. So I'm going to come join so Here's the four of us at the big airport of Washington, D.C. I had to slip that up because that was the beginning of our journey there. It was a long trip, but it was, it was great to be there. We experienced the big metro. I felt like a country pumpkin there. And um, it was uh, quite a trip there. And that's how we... That's how we um, Come on over to the slides. Yeah. That's how we travel from a rented... Um, furnished apartments and then hopped on the metro and then met into another station where Eric and his wife Lauren picked us up and took us to where we needed to go. The, as the Recovering Voices, the purpose of the program is perfect and uh, I'm not a fluent speaker but I got to listen to the elders talking among themselves about the various artifacts it was, it, and I learned so much about what their knowledge was as, as well. I was very interested in the different um, beadwork sewing and that kind of thing. And so I believe we achieved the goal because we all representative of the program from different perspectives, education, the elders, another generation that I'm trying to learn more about what it is to be thinking. And, uh, and then the staff, the staff was so supportive and so open and they were there to help us to look at our, our ancestors. And it, it was a very powerful experience and I still carry it with me today. Linda, if I could uh, just say a little bit about the, the context of the Smithsonian. Uh, I, I didn't, uh, Linda really uh, did a great job of preparing the slides for this. And, I didn't have a, a lot of time to add my images in that I would like to have to go and <laughs> say I, I've been throwing spears and catching cold and doing 3D stuff and everything, so I really appreciate the help which she's done. But to help set the stage for those of you who haven't been there before, the Smithsonian is the world's largest museum complex. There's 19 museums and research facilities, most of which are concentrated in D.C. on the ball, but some are in New York. We also have research facilities in Panama, and Hawaii, and Arizona, and the Smithsonian has as things going on everywhere. Even in the Anchorage Museum here, we have 600 Alaska objects on permanent loan to the Alaska Museum of Nature and Science, and we have people who work for the Smithsonian who are detailed to that. So we're kind of in everything and, and everywhere, and we have large, large collections. The Natural History Museum, where I work, has 148 million items in its collections. And the Smithsonian has everything from the space shuttle, big stuff, the Hope Diamond, to fleas, and DNA, <laughs> so big and small. In the Indian Museum, uh, has, uh, uh, I think they have 800,000 items in the Indian Museum. This was a two-week program, and our first week we were focusing at the Cultural Resource Center, and this is the entrance to the building there. And um, it was, that's where we start looking at uh, the different artifacts that they had available set out on tables for us, and we had the staff that helped us and taught us, you know, how to handle or they could handle things for us. And uh, the first week, it was, it was like going to work, 8 o'clock in the morning until like 5 or something like that. But there was no complaints because we, we knew how, how um, honored we were to be there. This is, this is Shirley that we spoke of, Kendall. She lives in Anchorage and with her is Ruth. And the thing that was unique about the, 
the visit this time is the use of technology. And um, Shirley is, is blind, but um, she has this viewer here that magnifies things for her. And she, she was able to examine the beadwork, sewing, and other things. And it was just phenomenal. Even, even looking at her screen, you could see the, the, the hand sewing, the stitches, the, you know, the work that was put into such a wonderful piece of, I hate to say it, artwork. It, the, the artwork had a purpose for everyday living. So it wasn't meant to put on walls to take a look at. They were either worn or you ate from them, or you did them for ceremony. They were everyday <coughs> living things. And that's, that's, how, that's how I felt, and I think most of us have felt viewing all these wonderful pieces. Here's Skin and um, Gabby, and her, her focus was looking at all the chill blankets. How many are there? Hundreds? No, maybe not hundreds, but uh, in the tens, maybe maybe twenty at the NMAI and, and the twenty at the Natural History Museum. So they specially set up some chill cap blankets for her on a step ladder so she can take pictures. She knew what she wanted to take a look at. Mm -hmm. um, there was a special um, woven portion on the chill cap blanket that let you know who was the <coughs> weaver. Yeah, right here. It's right here. It's, it's um, checkers or something like that. Well, come on, you can see the slides, Evo? Come on, Evo. Don't be shy. <laughs> Have to <laughs> pause for our claim later. <laughs> he's, he's another uh, headmaster of the Dr. Weedy House, Ed Well John. Glad you can make it, Evo. Thank you. This is um, Virginia again talking about a rattle. And um, Eric, would you please talk about what you have in your hand yeah. and, and then uh, so what we Veronica. Did, this was real, as, as uh, Linda mentioned, technology was really a highlight of this visit and that we used more technology with this visit in new ways that we had never done with the previous Smithsonian visit before. And in this case, we used a technology called video, which allowed us to teleconference with schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, Virginia is a school teacher in Wrangell, and so we teleconference. This is her class right there on that screen, and they can see what we are seeing through that. Uh -huh. So in real time, we are interacting with, and she's presenting to the class and asking questions back and forth as if they were there with us. And we could pick up and move the object. And this one is actually connecting to Linda and Shirley, because Florence. Or Florence, right? and because Florence was not feeling well. Right. So she and I stayed in the hotel or where we were staying at for two days, and. She goes, gosh, I know I wanted to see everything, and then mentioned it the night before. And then Eric says, well, let's see if we can hook you guys up <laughs> through using an iPad, because I brought mine. Huh? It was wonderful. I was able to hook up my iPad, and both of us, we were able to review more of the, what, the, what they were seeing for the two days while she was resting up and getting well. The I sound think that was good, the sound. Sound was pretty good. There was a little, a little tough the sound. I said because we had to be near the microphone for them to hear us. They couldn't hear everything around the room uh, so well. But uh, sound was something that uh, for the first time it was, it was pretty good. I thought this was particularly important because this showed that we can potentially connect with elders in Alaska that are that are sick or in hospice or anywhere, and they could be here and see the collections and ask us to turn that basket over. I want to see from this angle and things like that in real time. Have a conversation as if they're there. At the same time we were doing this, Shkin was connected with her class That's in right. Juno. Oh. So we actually were connecting with three different people, three different groups remotely. And the fourth thing, which we'll talk a little bit later, is Virginia also had a remote 3D digital camera that was a fisheye lens that was scanning the entire room all the time and recording everything in 360, which then she could take back to Wrangell and later let the kids put on virtual reality goggles and review those, and so they could be in the room with us, and they could be looking around and see the janitor come in and the clock over back behind us and see us work with the office over here, as if they were really there with us. And then while all this is happening, we were being videoed by the staff, as well as somebody was taking these pictures. Here's an example of something that was really, that, that caught my eye. It's a collar of dentalia uh, shells trimmed in otter. I was t telling John, I said, uh, 
the 25th anniversary kind of <laughs> No, no can do. Linda, uh, what, what, uh, where did that come from? Is that Klinget or is it? Yeah. It's every, Klinget. Every, everything you see here is Klinget. Klinget. Oh, okay. Yeah. Isn't that something? No, it's that amazing. is something. That made me something. Yeah. Now, um, this is uh, something that, that Florence, I, and uh, Shirley, and all of us ladies there were interested in. The, in uh, notice the pants with the, with the feet attached to it, and then this beautiful tunic. And here's that, oh, that must be the recorder, not the 360 camera, right? It might be the headset for the recorder for the videographers. Yeah, so on. that was just showing you more of the technology. Now, you would think, looking from the distance, oh, that's great beadwork. But in the next slide, Next slide. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I hope you can see it, but I have another picture closer. You can see they're not beads. It's porcupine quill. I was so astounded. And then what's wrapped around here is porcupine quill. And uh, I think it's beautiful. It's simple, geometric. Uh, I'm assuming it's a man that wears this tunic. And looking in the inside of the beautiful stitching and everything, it just it just makes me it just makes me think, oh that's what my grandmother or my great grandmother must have made. Here's a close up of the foot. You can see the long strip that came down the side of the leg and branched off and then went around the ankle there. And this all of this was made out of caribou. And it can you see how wonderful condition it is. Here's that video camera, that sort of technology. This is an example of the, how they um, get the artifacts. And what happened was before we came, all of us that came, we had received um, a PDF file and we went through the catalog and then we chose what it was that we would like to see. And then after that, they, the staff went and pulled all the, most all of these items and then arranged them. And it changes the next night because they're they're busy doing it and putting it put in a way what was seen the day before. <laughs> I showed this to Auntie Flo and I said, "Look, Auntie, you're taking a soak and a bit." <laughs> <laughs> she laughed. She thought that was funny. She kind of dared me if I was going to say it. And now I have witnesses, right? But this gives you an example of of the bedwood boxes that we were able to see. Some of, we got to see um, those planks for pattern boards, pattern boards that we Show got to see. Beads. Yeah, it was just astounding. And then towards Eric, um, there were some bowls. And um, uh, some of the bowls in uh, one of the storage area, when, when they opened up the, the cabinet, the odor was so strong from the oils and everything, it, it kind of teared up my eyes. But to know that that's what preserved that, the wooden stuff, that's... We should, if you could go back, but we, we should know too that uh, we were discovering new things about the objects that the Smithsonian cares for during this visit all the time throughout. It. Uh, and, and one of the things we, we noticed there, one of these pattern boards, when we turned it over and looked at the back of it, there was a pattern on the back of it too yeah. that had been kind of buffed down and yeah. it had been used, so it had been, in a sense, used and recycled. And it looked like it had evidence that it had been buffed down and painted over once before, so it may have been used two or three times. And museums are used to displaying one side, mm -hmm. and even if you look on their online catalogs, they'll show you one view of it, and the, what they think is the top view or the main view, and there may be a lot hidden on the objects as well that uh, revealed a longer, deeper, richer history of them. That's so true. When Schkid was looking at the Chilkat blankets, even though you see the beautiful design, I remember my grandmother would say, but the real story is behind it, mm -hmm. how it's woven, how the colors were changed and everything, how good your stitching was and everything. And so that was just as important as well as the design. Here's Alan. And he's looking at a shahia. Pardon? Is the pattern board still in use, or is that, uh, do they use it anymore? I, I asked Skin that, and I don't think she, she said she wasn't aware of anyone who was using pattern boards today. That a lot of them are going from, from 
what they have in their mind and in their, in their heads, or maybe they may take a sketch. I thought Clarissa had some sketches, on, not boards, but on big mm -hmm. pieces of paper and you peek oh, over there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think Gardner Jackson has used better words. Mm -hmm. So here's Alan, and I learned a lot from, from Alan. He's quiet, but when he speaks, it's important. And it's important to listen to him. And uh, we had a few chuckles. We, we were a, a great group. You know, it wasn't all serious. We kind of joke with each other and everything. He, he, was, he was one of them, but I'm glad he was there. Yeah. Garfield, he came a little later with Violet on a train, and then uh, so did Shkin. And they're looking she at, flew in. yeah, she flew mm -hmm. in, and they're looking at the um, Laguna um, These are listings. Of, uh, the audio recordings, the yeah. Laguna audio recordings from the 50s and the 60s yeah. that we have in the National Anthropological Archives and the Human Studies Film Archive. They have film and audio recordings from all over the world of anthropological subjects. And when Frederica de Laguna passed away, we received all of her papers. The National Anthropological uh, Archives receives uh, papers from anthropologists from all over the world, and they store them in archives in there. So we have all of our recordings from parties and quicks and, and uh, um, uh, Yakutat, primarily Yakutat. But there are some that we think were recorded elsewhere. And Garfield was spotting, and uh, I think also Ruth and Florence were spotting some inconsistencies with some of the notes there, that the stories and things that were marked were not attributed to the proper place. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had said that they, even when Freddie was down here and, and was turning them over, she remembered after she turned them over that she had made, made some mistakes in where she attributed them to and never got them corrected with the NAA. Mm -hmm. So they were recognizing things and correcting some things for the record as they went. And as Garfield and Shin then were listening to the recordings, then Garfield, and they were able to obtain copies of all these recordings too. The NAA copies those and gives them out to them. And Garfield later told me that he recognized a song for a house that had thought it had lost that song forever and he was able to get it back to them. Oh, wow. I, haven't, have, I haven't gotten more details from him of exactly who that was, but that would be that that's what these archives are for. That's what these collections are for, is to house and curate and archive them and protect them so that they can come back to future generations and be, be continue to be available. Mm. What Alan was showing how to make soap berries. I think it was Ruth that had a jar of uh, soap berries. And this was the time that it was towards the end of the first week at the Cultural Center. Um, the staff and, uh, and the management put together a potluck for us and so wanted to contribute and share soap berries. What we had learned is you can't use vanilla that has alcohol in it because it would deflate it. <laughs> but we still served it because we wanted everybody to have a taste. We didn't come empty-handed either. We had gifts, um, small token gifts to show our appreciation. So we, we, you know, the the staff members that were there, one head management person there, and we gave them these um, seal skin hearts trimmed in in beads, and and then some of them received um, beaded bracelets that wrapped around, and um, it's. It's just showing our appreciation and some of who we are as people that we really appreciate all the work that you have done for us. This picture was taken in front of the Smithsonian Castle. I, you can't see the castle, but here's all of us there. And the, the Smithsonian has this nonprofit group called the Smithsonian Women's Committee, and they raise money. And they have these um, uh, uh, craft show, craft show, and they're having another one pretty soon. Two of them, and uh, they raise money so they, so we could do something like this, uh, this this grant. And they were curious. They were curious about. Okay, we supported this uh, group of people. What you guys are all about? Well, in a nicer way. <laughs> you know, this is me, and. Um, so they invited us for tea. They had refreshments. We got to go in the castle. We got to meet um, everybody there. And while they were talking about themselves, 
Then it was our turn. So we talked about um, our button roll blankets, who we are, what a potlatch is, and everything. They were, it was an undivided audience, really. And we had these little um, pins from uh, state legislators that showed the, the Alaska flag and a couple of others and gave each one of them. And it, synchronicity, it was just the right amount to give to every one of them. They were just so thrilled, like, oh boy, I got a pin. <laughs> and if you can go back one slide, please. Oh, Violet, uh, at this, as things, as you, as you know, things often develop into, it went more than a tea, it became a little kawik with examples of sharing of the culture, of little tastes for the Women's Committee of what happens during the week and the balance between the opposites and the singing of songs, because songs are sung back and forth, and Garfield put on his robe and sang. And Violet danced for the first time Aww. with the oh, other yeah. Kilwells. Because he could, he could never get her to dance at home. <laughs> <laughs> with skin and Gabby. Yeah, and me and Linda, we actually had a pretty big pod there. And so Violet danced, and he was really impressed with her. Just just blending That's in right, right away is natural nice. for yes, so right. He was very proud. And as you know, um, uh, you have you need that balance, the ravens and the eagles, and so that was it. Just it just worked out that way. Wow. It the the the, the spirit and the, and the feeling and the environment. It it just flowed. It just happened. I, I can't express it anymore. So they came the weekend and. We thought, oh, we get to sleep in. Tada! No, we're, we're taking you to go see the American Indian Museum. And this is the picture if nobody has been there. And it was awesome, really awesome. And um, just a brief description about the building, but it doesn't really tell the story. We liked the gift shop. <laughs> we didn't make it to the cafe, but I understand the food is phenomenal because you have a little bit of taste of this and a little taste of that from the different, um, like the Woodland Indians and the Plains Indians and maybe from South America or something like that. Central yeah. America, Northwest Coast. They're Northwest Coast, a little bit of everything. So maybe next time we'll get down there we can have a taste. And we did get to see some some displays there. Okay, I thought this was from the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., but it was mentioned to me, it looks more like um, Anchorage or someplace else, but this gives you a flavor of the type of displays that are in these museums, not just the American museums, but all of them. And I, what caught my eye is up there in the left-hand yeah. corner, Lincoln <laughs> but um, next slide. In the rotunda, this is where this picture is taken at, uh, displays the many different types of canoes. And I think this is a kayak. And then down there towards Eric is the outrigger. And then there's a, the three yeah. reboat. And the next slide shows a close up picture. Can you imagine that floats? <laughs> <laughs> wow. And then here's a, a, what's it, a bark canoe. It was just phenomenal. Then we got to go to the Natural Museum. And this is in the middle part of the museum. This was awesome, looking at that elephant. Got to see, like he said, the Hope Diamond. And... Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, the beginning was torture. <laughs> And, um, oh my, there was just so much to see in this museum. Well, I definitely would like to come back. Now, the second week came, and then we went to the Museum Support Center. And here's the entrance here. And there were two pods there, as the slide is saying. And the there, picture is four total. Four total, but two we went into. There were actually well, five total, I'm sorry. We added another one. Okay. And we're planning a six. We already ran out of room. <laughs> okay, the next slide. Which went to two. Okay, that's right. So here's the game again. And this is Judith Andrews, and she was phenomenal. She kept us on schedule. She did the videography. She uh, was very personable, educating us. And uh, towards the end, we were so impressed with her of all her work and her being so 
gracious and everything. She received a trinket thing. Mm -hmm. Here is the Chief Shake's canoe. And this is how they Linda, store it. You said she received a trinket thing? No. Alan. Wasn't it Alan? No. Daisy Florence. Florence. Yeah. Florence. And actually Florence and Ruth. Florence and Ruth. Oh, so she uh, mm -hmm. she's obligated to two. <laughs> yeah. So um, Chief Shakes canoe. This gives you an idea how it's stored and then they did pull it out and we got to see the inside. It was huge. I can only see it being in the ocean. And then the, the, you can't see the designs, but when you got close and really look at the designs, it, it's just phenomenal that it's, it's still there. So this is, oh, we go back. Sorry. So this is, uh, as, as she mentioned, this rolls out. It's on a frame there. So we can just wheel the roll, right, roll yeah. the wheels out. You can walk all the way around and climb the ladders and look down inside. And this was, this was called the Killowell Canoe because it had a Killowell painted on the side here. This is also called the Brown Bear Canoe because it had brown bears on the prow and on the stern back here, which are not on it now. They were, they were taken off for storage and they're set aside so we were able to wheel out the pallet with those on it as well. They're badly damaged, their ear missing on one, palm missing on the other. And this is, a, I hope, will be a big 3D project for us one day is to scan those and then digitally we could repair the, the, the heads of those. They could, they could potentially mill another one or make a 3D print to send a wrangle for them, for their carvers. And this is, a, uh, I think this is 48 feet long, and uh, it completes four wow. feet eight wide, five feet two deep. I think is the dimensions of it. And we do have photographs of this on the water in the 1880s with Klingit full of wearing full regalia standing there. So we know exactly what this looked like when it was in good shape. So it would be easy to uh, remake models of it that are painted and look the way it would when it was in good condition. What this Smithsonian. What did you say the width was? Uh, I think it was it was either four foot eight. It's four foot eight by five foot two in one dimension, and or the other. I can get you the big specifics. I get them mixed up sometimes. This is that background, and my head's a little foggy today. <laughs> but uh, uh, this, um, what was I going to say? No, I, I apologize. This, uh, but this this is an example. Of, oh, I, I remember. This is so big. We. Uh, before we built this facility in the 80s, this is out, this is not, not downtown in DC, this is out in the Maryland. We don't have space. They used to have objects in kegs under stairways in the museum because you had millions of objects stored in that one building with the exhibits and offices. They never had room. So they built this facility in the 80s and started moving collections out. And they're still moving collections out of the downtown out to this facility in Maryland. And these canoes were too big to fit inside there. In the 70s, when I first came to the Smithsonian, these big canoes, and we have another Kwakwaka canoe that is almost 60 feet long, that they had to cut in half down the center, oh, oh, cut in half to get it into the museums because they were so big. And they used to store these hanging from a ceiling in a building next to the Smithsonian Castle until World War II when they were worried about bombing from the Germans, so they took all the canoes down and they stored them in another facility, kind of in sheds, out in the um, remote areas to try to protect the collections in case the Germans began bombing D.C. And in the 70s, these were actually sitting in the courtyard outside the museum in the courtyard and within the area of the museum, completely exposed to the weather. And uh, kids, I think, if I remember correctly, I think they would let kids walk up and touch these and kind of climb on them and things like that. And that's one reason why they're so warm. And I think Bill Holm actually has a photograph of these when it was freshly painted. And I think the museum painted it uh, several times to try to restore it because it was always stored outside because they didn't have space for it. So we know Bill Holm did do good drawings of it. So it could be redone, but the museum now our practice is we don't touch these. We don't even try to uh, to uh, modify them or repaint them or anything like that. But as you saw from some of the 3D technology, there's lots of options for something like this in the future to try to bring it back in more ways than one. This is one of the screens that we were able to see. Um, this is a close-up slide about it. And uh, I think it was called the bear. This one is the bear, right? Yeah, bear. this is actually, there are four of these, and they also came from Wrangell. And when they came, they were collected by uh, Swanton in uh, 1904. And they were actually uh, two screens on, on a panel. They were 14 feet by uh, seven feet. 
And again, after they were collected by the Smithsonian, Smithsonian cut them in half and made four mm -hmm. separate ones so they could hang one in the, uh, along with the canoes and things like that. And so they're all separated now. You can see they're framed. They have a frame on them that kind of code seals part of the lower design there. And on the frame on this side, that wasn't there. The museum has touched it up uh, by putting red paint in there to kind of create visual borders. We know that that red paint is new because it matches the paint on the frames because we tested the paint. I think the black is original though. Yeah. And you could see um, the original rope, remember, yeah, the behind, behind lashings. The, the lashings that kept these panels together. Wow. It was really... And there's something. very intricate lines that aren't visible here, especially with the daylight coming in. And if you get close up with the raking light, where there's the relief on it from fine black lines that were painted. And it, it, this had to have been outside sometime, probably before it was even collected. And whether wore it down, where the lines were, it protected the wood behind it. And so it created a natural relief to it. And then later the black even wore off. But it almost, when I showed this to some conservators, they said, this is carved. And we, they had to look at it for a long time because it's such fine relief. So there's lots of detail there that uh, um, is different. They're very close, but all four of them are slightly different. And this is something, too, that we're experimenting with 3D technology. Our 3D guys think that they can videotape, or it can take lots of photos like this and then create a map that shows all of those fine lines. And so this is something that I was talking with Harold about, this idea that we might be able to get such a detailed map of this that we could send that to Wrangell and we could project that map onto a new panel or a new wall and repaint it. Here's an idea of how big these panels are with the group here. This is Shirley's husband here. Shirley wearing her Regalia. One of these four is in Anchorage, in the Anchorage Museum of Nature and Science. I'll go to them to be exhibited if you get a chance to see that in person. This was awesome for me to see because I was, Ben, you remember you, you and I went to the World's Fair, the Seattle World's Fair? This is the totem that came from Haynes. Mm -hmm. This is the one that Uncle Ed, Charlie Jim, Tommy Jimmy, Leo Jacobs with the help of Carl Heidmiller. And you could see the division of, of the carvers, the techniques and, and everything like that. I don't know which one was uncle, but I felt it. And it was just awesome. And I was so excited. And I was wheeling Auntie Flo there. And we were both chattering away. And, and it was just awesome to, to, to know where the pole is. I always wondered what happened to the pole after the World's Fair. Oh, this this is an awesome catch. Eric. She brought her Ravenstow rope and her weavings and in her house at night she was in there weaving away. And uh and so was Gabby. And, and Gabby, Gabby was helping him. And uh <clears throat> so we were sitting there and Garfield was listening to the recordings and it was just you know didn't stop at the end of the workday when the museum had to shut its doors. It, it continued all night long and all weekends long. We were kind of enveloped in plenty of culture everywhere. And we were watching her weaving and I realized there were so many roads and she had very little time, only a few days. And so we really wanted to make sure that she got time with the roads. And it just struck me that, that uh, what we were seeing her doing, we needed to, in a sense, document and show that that's part of the story of her visit. And so we asked if she would be interested in uh, having her photo taken with the robes from the Natural History Museum uh, arrayed around her. And when I first had this vision, you know, I thought we could spread out many, many, many robes. But once we, uh, <coughs> we, had the, we covered an entire uh, hallway in the facility as, as wide as this room is, that hallway is that wide. And we covered it with paper and taped it down and had big crew working on getting it in position. And even with that great space, we only had room for a few robes that we could put out because they are so big yeah. and they are so wide. And so we had many more on trays ready and lined up. And we called it caused a big stir because there were people in the museum saying, we don't have time, we don't have people in the so we can do this, we can do this. And let's do this. So get out of the way and we'll do this. And so then we, we did this and I actually added a couple more slides to Linda's oh, presentation here to, okay. to show this uh, yeah. from different views. We brought in a pattern board and so we took a few different ones and we brought in some leggings and things like that. Oh one. yeah, so it we was have a phenomenal photo shoot. The rest of us, we got to watch. Yeah, Isn't that great. cool? I think even... Yep. Thank you.
And I think even Ruth took a photo from way back. There was kind of a catwalk going across the aisle <laughs> of way back away. She took great pictures just with her personal camera from there. And I think they were already sending them out on Facebook. Yeah. And we did with the ancestors on it. And they were almost as good as this professional photographer shot wow. just from there. So it was really uh, a great experience for everybody, I think. Uh, and because she really did feel like she was surrounded. Oh, she did. For her. She did. This is Esther. She is one of the staff members here. And in this setting, we were in one of their labs at this facility. And so they brought out, I think, a little bit things a little bit more uh, fragile, uh, maybe a closer look as a group. And this is um, a, a headdress that uh, the three there, Cole, Florence, and uh, Ruth, and uh, Alan were examining here. Esther's a special lady. Um, she understood things. She had a um, another um, employee, a staff member that did sign language. She's deaf, but she reads lips. You would not have known. But uh, she was awesome too, and she helped us, to, you know, with the the gloves. And she was very careful uh, if we wanted to see the underneath of the object or or anything that we wanted. She helped us. This is an example, you can see down the hall here, um, aisle here, drawers, cabinets, whole, whole bunch of beautiful things. This one is just uh, soap berry spoons, some other kind of carved, um, horn carved spoons, uh, all kinds of uh, spoons in there. And it was just awesome to see how our people put made things to use. Here's another drawer that showed more items. This is just an example. There was a drawer that had a chill cap blanket that wasn't finished that Shkin and Gabby got to see and it still had the gut bags in there at the end of the, of the uh, fringe there. It was just intact. Here's Auntie looking at a Tana. She was so excited to see that and I wanted to put that picture in there. There's me, the studious me. Mm -hmm. I was taking a look at the, the uh, De Laguna papers, and there was one file that she had done on Klukwan. Mm -hmm. And in her notes was genealogy, families that I recognized, and in it was um, census from, from those years of, of uh, not only Klukwan, but Angoon as well. And then the charts she had of the genealogy and notes about what she saw in the, in the village. I was just blown away. And then there was copies of maps of Klukwan showing where the houses were at in the cemetery and everything. And I was, I was able to get a copy of that. That's how accommodating the staff was. Oh, yes. You know, we have a form here. You let us know what you want and everything like that, but you got to pay up front. And uh, they did, and they made it electronically, and, I, and they sent it to me. Within two weeks after being there, I received these awesome maps of Angoon and of Klokwan. Yes. Here's Alan and Virginia taking a look at this, this collar, right? Mm -hmm. Or helmet here. Mm -hmm. And here again, the technology. This is also connecting to the class in Wrangell. So we did it several times over several days at both museums' collections. And here Alan is explaining to the class how the mask would have been held with a mouthpiece. There's a pit in there, and there's a helmet back here. So he's showing the class how the, this armor would have been worn and, and handled. And here, here again, we're look at this is a, a shark headdress, big one from Wrangell. And uh, the, the dorsal fin is doesn't take it off there, the pectoral fins there, and it had big, almost like a rubberized leather yes. uh, a, a kind of a trailer or cape that went back huge. that would conceal the. And the there's weather. Virginia holding up the 360 camera. Mm -hmm. and, and we're connecting with her class at the class same time. Because wow. as their class, first their class saw it one day, and then the teacher told the principal about it, and then the principal showed, well, wanted to see it the next day. And then the principal wanted the superintendent to see it the next day. <laughs> and so and by the end of that third day, they said, we see the potential for this technology now. We're already thinking about what kind of grants we want to apply for to bolster the technology on their end so they can do this more with the kids. 
Mm -hmm. as well as skin witnesses as well, yeah. and probably would like to expand that in Angoon. Here is another um, uh, luncheon that was put together, and there's a, a few of us there having fun, and um, we said our thank yous to the, the staff members there, and um, back at the Soapberry, um, Ruth remember a Soapberry song, so we got to sing that, and so um, we were well received, I felt. And, uh, this is when Judith was adopted. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's Lauren. That is awesome. Oops. Big study. Yeah. There's Lauren. Mm -hmm. So there's a big guna chish that listed Eric. He, he, not only did he provide transportation, meals, his, he opened up his home, he coordinated that with us. Um, very, very generous, both he and Lauren. And, uh, show, and Lauren was good showing us the roads of how to use the Metro. Now, ladies, this is how you use this machine to put more money for your, <laughs> your ticket that you had to slide to get into the Metro. Then we had to learn when you go down the escalator, you stand to the far right because people are running down to your left <laughs> to catch the train. They were blowing you over. <laughs> <laughs> and then Judith, this, the lady that got the name, did the videoing and provided information, she edited all of this information of two weeks in a, in a month or so and made jump drives and sent them to each one of us for us to do a presentation and to share with others of what our experience is. And so this is the staff at the National Museum of American Indians, and then the, the Natural History Museum here, and then we, of course, we wanted to mention Joanne and Andy for giving us the opportunity to change. So that's our experience. <laughs> yes, Selena. I always heard from my elders in Angoon that everything has a spirit. Everything around us has a spirit. We are all taught to speak very respectfully about the trees, the fish, anything. And natural sounds in the museum. I was in D.C. with my daughter. And they either buildings settling or whatever you hear, anything at night, they said the spirits are there. The spirits from our artifacts are there. I forgot to say that Virginia, she carried a drum. And on the first day when we were there, Selena, we felt it. Mm -hmm. And so she sang. She sang to our ancestors, thank you for us, for us to be there. We appreciate. We <laughs> hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. We we hear you. And then after she was done to have balance, Alan sang. And it it just it just set the stage of of all of this. At the the screens, she sang as well, and we sang as well too, thanking spirits, and we thank. We all concluded um, that we felt that they are in good hands. Even though they're not home with us here in Alaska, their home being well taken care of in the museum. And that we, my understanding is we can go there anytime, call first, so they could be prepared and we could see our ancestors. And that, that meant a lot, because I thought, oh God, i got to get this done, <laughs> you know. But to know that, we, that any one of us, we can call Eric or anybody, we would like to come and look at our, our ancestors. This Recovering Voices program, uh, and, and uh, I think uh, we have a couple flyers um, about the program, but, uh, and there's more online, I think these might be the only a few ones that we have left, but uh, since the Clinket used it 
this year, I think Clint would not be eligible again until uh, a year, I think it's two years mm -hmm. in between, and then the same community that will host. This program is for to bring in fluent speakers and apprentice speakers or learners together to view the collections and so they have a, a context in which to talk about the objects and the ways they were used, the terminology for them, the language that's attached to them, and to help video record that so it's to add to the archive for future generations and to teach and preserve the language as well as connect back to the material culture and bring back things that can be done. So it's to try to preserve and protect languages. And the, we do this for cultures all over the world. So this which, uh, Recovery Voices program brings in communities from all over the world. It was just this time the a Klingit delegation came, and I think they have two or th they have four per year, I think, where they're bringing in people, communities from all over the world. And this next year, I think there's only one group from, I think, California, and all the rest are from Polynesia and from Asia and places like that. So we do that. So we collect from all over the world. Well, while we were there, there were people from the Southwest. <coughs> that were there too as well and that and so we were able to have lunch in the big lunch room and so we we were all excited that we were all there and we got to exchange our experiences and everything and that was awesome too to share but i wanted to let people know too if you as an individual or a pair of you mother and daughter uh, a father and son or, or uh, carvers there are other programs i i have uh, forms in in our uh y'all 107 where we have the 3d in there i have some papers there for what we call the Native American Community Scholars Award. And that is funded through the Smithsonian Fellowship Program. And that can fund someone for up to 21 days for $175 a day to offset your costs. So you could come for four days or you could come for three weeks. And uh, George Bennett and his son did that to come to study the bedwood boxes and the wood. And you get to work at both museums again mm -hmm. with the collections. So we've had weavers come through to study the weaving for two weeks and to, to relearn some of the techniques that are there. In basketry, we had a big delegation from Ona come for, I think, I think they came for a week and a half or two weeks. And the first Recovering Voices program, when they first got set up, well, there were, I think, six people that came that were Ona weavers studying the basketry. And so if, you're, if you can't come for two weeks and you can't put together a big delegation, there are options for coming to a, a small, and there's two application periods uh, per year for that. And then we have separate grants for students as well, if they're enrolled in college students. So are, are there like a, uh, an apprentice showing and teaching on that side at all? Is that something you've ever considered? Well, that's what this program is for, is to try to bring in. So a lot of times when the language speakers come, they get in a, a fluent speaker and an apprentice speaker. And we had several fluent speakers here. And, and then, other people who are learning, and because Virginia and Shkin in particular are teachers and are trying to teach the culture and clean language in there, and since they were apprentices in this case, sometimes they're apprentices and a uh, uh, student that have already been working together for a long time and, and come as a team that way. But uh, in, in this case also, it was, it was pulling together a team that, uh, uh, especially important to have the teachers, uh, that were Shkin and, and uh, Virginia, to be able to try to help carry this forward. I, I'm so glad and grateful to Selena um, for raising the the question about the spirit. And I'm going to talk about a robe that was returned recently to Sitka. And the men were talking weeks and months beforehand. Mm -hmm. And one of the men said, it's not the family that's returning the robe. It's the spirit that's talking to the family to return the robe. And I was listening, and then the men greeted the family when they came into Sitka. And the men spoke to the road and spoke to the family and thanked them. And then the family that brought the road back, without any pre-conversations or anything, she responded and said, thank you. But it wasn't us that was bringing, that's bringing this road back. The road has been speaking to us. My mouth dropped. So I wanted to take this occasion to say thank you, Selena. I had a question concerning that. But the day she Tan and the Kaguan Tan and the Kiksadi were there when I came to the museum with the Dutch Fluidi. And I was so grateful that you were there. Your brother was there to drum to the spirits and to talk. And the reason I'm sharing that today is for everyone in this room 
because of the overwhelming respect and the spirits that came through, like Linda talked about the synchronicity of what occurred, it couldn't have been a better person that I noticed all thing that were working together on this recovering voices. And it was so beautiful that it happened. So I want to say thank you to the Daisy Khan and the Kagwan Khan for that motivating this together and making that occur. Um, and I had in my notes, Linda had mentioned that she felt it uh, with her uncle Edwin, but the pole, and she felt it. So I'm talking about the respect and the future generations that go to the Smithsonian or any other museum. I really appreciate that. And then I wanted to ask another question because with that, Eric and Linda have, and, and Anya and I, we've talked so much about intellectual property and the changing of what's going on now. And um, the Facebook and, and uh, you know, the clan ties to the items at any museum, the Smithsonian. And I don't want to drop names, but I, I need to talk about this because Lily White, Agnes Bellinger, Lena Farkas, Sally Edwards, they always talk, and Sally, she even told me one time, she says, if, and she squashed the pun, she put the name on me, and she says, she was emphasizing that crest. You can't wear somebody else's crest, and she wanted to emphasize it so hard you can't use, you can't take anyone else's crest, and she could, She wanted to get it in my head. They'll put you in jail. And it was so genuine. But that's what I, is in my heart, that every one of these items is tied to one of our clans. And there's ownership that when, like Lily White said, there's a song and a story that ties to that original clan owner. So it's not for copying by just randomly. And that's why I wanted to say thank you to Eric and Judith that worked so hard and, and Linda on preparing for the trip and the balance because they were deliberate to look at items from Randall to tie with Virginia, items that were specifically related to their clan. And then we worked real hard in advance with the students. What clans did they come from so that their teachers could be working to look at their, it wasn't just random, let's just go look at items. Yeah. And so I wanted to raise that, and before I turn it back over to you concerning Thank intellectual you. property and respect for that, I wanted to make sure my, my brother had a moment. Thank you, Selena. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for the way they are my children, people, and also my brother, children are not waiting, so you can hear our, our children's people. When they talk about the spirit, we were down there with Eric when we stayed with him, and uh, we were walking into this big wall, and the, the museum people, there were six or three of them. Eric wasn't there, I don't think. He might have been. But we were walking into the big wall, and me and Joey and Andy stopped, at the door as soon as we walked in. And the museum people kept walking ahead of us. And they stopped when they saw us. And they uh, started fucking going. They started rubbing his drum. And we went, me and Andy went over and took by Joey. And Joey did the song. And both Joey and I saw images of people dancing because they were so happy to hear the click. Like it's uh, Joey said, we're letting them know that we're coming in here and we don't mean any harm to mm -hmm. Thank you for your presentation for both of you. We really appreciate it. It was very well done. And if those folks that want to come, there's, there's a gentleman here that he helped, and my husband helped, and several helped. We didn't just go on the dime of the 
the Recovering Voices program. Linda's sister paid for her ticket um, to go, and we had lots of, we, we, there were a lot of people that, and, and uh, George Reifenstein helped, his kid study. So if you decide you're going to go, there's a lot of effort that you can start working on now to start saving money, because it they funded part of it, but we really, have a lot of contributors, um, and okay, so, so I'll end with that. Do you have a GoFundMe group? Yes, <laughs> and I should mention, I'm, I'm on the western side here, sorry. <laughs> when I called and asked about um, Ruth, I called the tribe, and the tribal administrator, she says, yes, I'm donating $500. She says, I'm going to put you in touch with the um, foundation. I called, yes, we're going to start raising money now for Ruth. Ruth said, yes, I'll pay my own way to Juno, and, and then the money just started. I called Virginia. She says, yes, my brother-in-law is going to take care of me. Um, then the tribe, yes, we're going to take care of her. So we were able, and then um, Shirley, paid, Shirley her paid her own way. So it was a little bit of money from the Recovering Voices to get it going, but it wasn't it was everybody coming together. It was a community. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sorry to take your time. <laughs> Thank you for, for uh, listening to us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Chief. Chief.